So now we move to chapter five, which will be page 131 in your text. A survey of property, probability concepts. All right, thus far we've talked about one form of, or one field of statistics. We've talked about descriptive statistics. We use statistics to describe some data. We use statistics to help us pinpoint locations or at least frame locations, locate data, analyze it from its location. Starting in chapter five with probability, we are going to move to a second faucet of statistics. And that is computing the chance that something will occur in the future. Okay, what we call this is inferential statistics. What is the likelihood that an event will occur in the future? What comes to mind right now? Getting struck by lightning. Being struck by lightning. I, I think of weather. While I'm thinking about weather, let's be mindful of those in Houston and Texas and those who are down in the islands and down in Florida. Okay. Hurricane, witnessing Hurricane Harvey, affecting Hurricane Irma. But the weatherman or woman, 70% chance of rain. Football season is upon us. You might see something. Your favorite football team is expected to win. Vegas odds. Vegas odds. All right, before we describe odds, first, let's introduce probability. Probability of value between zero and one. Inclusive. Describing the relative possibility that an event will occur. All right, so we're going to say probability What's the range? It's going to range 0 to 1. How do you think you interpret 0? Probability of zero. Absolutely the most minute chance that it's ever going to occur. I wouldn't even say getting struck by lightning. I use an example. The sun will not rise tomorrow. So zero. Unlikely. Remember, we can never say with absolute certainty that the sun is not going to rise tomorrow. But we can say there's strong indication, the highest of indications, that it will rise. Okay, so that would take me over here. The sun will rise tomorrow. Probability that we will have rainfall in the next year. Pretty certain. This probability is going to be out here by one. Then we will introduce how you solve 
What you're learning now is how we can quantify and give deeper meaning to when you hear the term probability. Understand now that you can analyze it, assign a quantitative number here, and give you a stronger knowledge or stronger indications of which way it leans. So next time the weatherman or woman says that there's a 60% chance of rain, call your radio stationers and ask, what's the probability measure on that? All right, so probability, zero to one. And yes, before you do, software packages will calculate this for you. Now, sometimes the likelihood of an event, I heard Vegas odds. So sometimes you will see probability stated in odds. And say you have an example that your favorite team has a five to two chance in winning. How would you define that? You have a five and two chance to win. So how many outcomes are possible here? Seven. seven. And you have five out of a seven chance of winning. All right, good job. Next. Let me get my slides up. And let's talk about an experiment. An experiment, a process that leads to the occurrence of one and only several possible results. You're going to need to separate that from an outcome a particular result of an experiment, and then the event, a collection of one or more outcomes of an experiment. Okay. Look at the chart on the bottom of page 134. We're going to roll a die. I'll give you insight into the English language that you may not have known. A die is singular. Whenever you use the word dice, remember, you're referring to two or more. So a die. If I roll a die... That is the experiment. Now let's draw this little device up here. How many dots are on a die? Anywhere from one to six, right? So we're gonna say one to six. What are all possible outcomes? Six. Well, I'm either going to roll a one, a two, a three, four, five, or a six. What are some possible events that could come out of this? Even or odd. You roll even. Uh, greater than or less than certain figures. Good job. All right. Classical probability. How would we define this? It's 
classical probability is based on the assumption that the outcomes of an experiment are equally likely. Remember, equally likely. So back when I was rolling that die, did I have an equal chance of rolling a one as I did a six? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the probability of an event occurring is Six over six, one. Just looking at you. As I write, and you're chanting out numbers. <laughs> All right, total number. Possible outcome, so we'll just put a possible. So in this using the classical probability. What was the probability that I would have rolled a one? Six times. One over six. The favorable outcome that I'm looking for would have been a one. And there were six possibilities. What would have been the probability that I roll an even number? Um, one over three. <laughs> one over two. Well, let's first, I mean, yeah. I could have rolled a two, a four, or a six. Then I can simplify <coughs> that fraction. So the outcome is the number of times you roll. Total number of possible outcomes. It's not the number of times I roll. Each time I rolled that die, I had an equal chance of rolling anywhere from one to a six. I had an equal chance of rolling a one as I did a three. That's favorable outcomes, right? No, that's the total number of outcomes. Okay. The favorable outcome is what am I looking for? What's favorable to me? I'm asking if I would have had, in this case, it was favorable for me to roll an even number. So the favorable for the even number, wouldn't it be three? Over the six? Like a two, four, or a six? Isn't that three? I have a two out of six chance of occurring. No. I thought we have a three out of six. Because you got three. Well, two, four, six. You're right. Oh. Two, three. Yeah, so if I have, you can tell I'm not a gambler. It's a half. Yeah. Thank you. I thank Nora. Thank you. Keep me using stock market examples. Let's, let's get this out of the casino. All right. Now let's look at empirical probability. Can someone read that for me. The probability of an event happening is the fraction of the similar events happened in the past. The probability of an event happening is the fraction of the similar events happened in the past. All right, so we would say the number of the times an event occurs. divided by total number of observations. All right, look at an example on page 137. All right, the 
book does introduce you to something here called the law of large numbers. Who can tell me what this is? Over a large number of trials, the empirical probability of an event will approach its true probability. Best example, imagine you're holding a quarter. Let's take it to monetary values. I can speak better here. All right, you're holding a quarter and you flip it. What's the probability that I get a hit? Half. Half. Okay, would that mean that, would I be guaranteed to get, if I flipped it a second time, would I be guaranteed to get the tails? No. You mean the first time you did have the new tails? No. No. So the law of large numbers, what it will say though, is that if I flipped that coin 10 million times, as my number of observations expands and draws out, I would, that number would slowly approach 50%. As long as I'm doing it within a small number of observations, I could be tit for tat, head for tails. But if I repeat that observation a large number of times, I will start to approach my true empirical probability. You mean your odds of getting to be the end of my heads or tails? The odds of it being five million to five million heads and tails. Yeah, it goes, it goes it's closer. Gonna, to it's gonna, it's gonna get closer to that 50%. And okay. you're right where I have one of each equal amount of heads and tails. Okay. All right, so look at this example. On February 1st, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia exploded. <clears throat> this was the second disaster in 113 space missions for NASA. On the basis of this information, what is the probability that a future mission is successfully completed? Okay, so we want to say what is the probability of a successful flight. Probability of a successful flight. Okay, second, that means two. So the total number of successful flights, how many did I have? 113. I had 111. I had a total number of flights of 113. So a total number of observations was 113. That was given to me. Now it says that of that 113, I had two unsuccessful missions. So if I had two unsuccessful, I had 111 successful. Point nine eight or ninety eight percent chance of having a successful flight. Is this within my range? Remember probability zero to one. Basically from zero percent to what you very close to one. Okay. Third. We'll go to subjective probability. So this is number three. And subjective probability, the likelihood of a particular event happening that is assigned by an individual 
based on whatever information is available. Okay, subjective. In practice, there's gonna be times when you have little to no information available to you. You might not know the number of successful missions. You might not have data on how many possible outcomes or how many outcomes had occurred in the past. Whenever you have very little or no data, we assign what we call subjective probability. And this is where the person is going to assign a probability based on whatever data or whatever resources they have available to them. Is it penny stocks? Not penny stocks. No. no. <laughs> so look, estimating tomorrow, NFL kicks off. Patriots in Kansas City are going to open up. What's the likelihood that the New England Patriots will play in the Super Bowl this year? Fifty percent chance, I guess. So. I don't know. Doing the way in some cheating, or the one thing you will not do is just guess. No, you just pull fifty percent out because that's where you thought was the balance. But you could probably narrow that down a little bit more using some data that you have. But truthfully, you could not apply one of the two formulas that we just looked at. Another example, the likelihood you are involved in an auto accident in the next 12 months. Depends on the weather. I guess 0% if you didn't, if you never drove. Yeah, well, True. All right, on the bottom of page 138, you're going to see a nice summary to the approaches of probability. So remember, classical and empirical, we can say they are both objective. The third type being subjective. The classical approach is based off of equally occurring chances. So each outcome has an equal chance of occurring. Empirical is going to be based off of some relative frequency. Something else happened before it. And whenever you hear empirical, I want you to think about the law of large numbers. All right. Flip over to page 140, and we're going to start doing some. First, we are going to add probability. All right, so the probability, we'll state it this way, the probability of either a or B occurring is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. FYI, if I had the probability of, if I had three outcomes possible, so the probability of A, B, or C, okay, so an example, the top of page 141, a machine fills plastic bags with a mixture of beans, broccoli, and other vegetables. Most of the bags contain the correct weight, but because of the variation in the size of the beans and the other vegetables, a package might be underweight or overweight. We even saw this topic come up in last week's discussions. Again, example with the chicken breast. My comments to you were, when it's put in there, there can be, this is where I was going with it. 
You know, if the stated weight is out there and it says you are buying one, you know, each breast is one quarter, one quarter pound. I don't, I'm probably thinking burgers here, but one quarter pound. <laughs> You know, I don't think if we're mass producing those, Tyson Food is actually measuring each individual breast to make certain that it is exactly a quarter pound. All right, so we know that we're going to have slight variations. The bags could be either underweight or overweight. Now, if we're in the business here, and let's go with Tyson Foods, one thing that a food distributor will do, while they will not test every single bag of vegetables that went down the assembly line, they're randomly going to pull samples out. They have to ensure, you know, they have to ensure that they're over the vast majority of what goes out and says that it's a quarter of a pound. They better be near a quarter of a pound. Only way they can ensure that is they are going to pull these samples and test it. So what we see here is of the 4,000 packages that were pulled. All right, so we look, we pulled 4,000 packages. Okay, now, how many were underweight? All right, I'm going to call underweight. We're going to call this outcome A. And there was 100 that were underweight. How many were equal? Outcome B was 3,600. Now, what's the other possible outcome here? Overweight. Overweight. And how many were overweight? 300. All right. I always say, be sure first that you check your data. Okay, so we do have 4,000, which tells us up here. Now, what's the probability of event A occurring? One hundred divided by four thousand is point zero two five. What's the probability of event B occurring? One hundred. The probability of a hundred. Point nine. Wouldn't that be a probability of a thousand? Wait, a thousand? Oh, point oh, two five. Never mind. I was thinking point two five. Okay, so the probability of outcome B point is nine. what? Point nine. Point nine. Point nine. Mm -hmm. Can we take it out more decimal points? Uh, zero. Since this is out, so remember, <laughs> remember when you're going to add. You know, while that is known, let's kind of keep them lined up here. All right, now what's the probability of outcome C? Point zero seven five. Now remember, one of the assumptions here is that all probabilities, all possible outcomes are being considered. Test your data. Now, if I wanted to say, what's the probability of uh, 
A or C occurring? A or C would be part one. A or C. So we could state this of saying, what's the probability of A or C? So what's the probability of A? And the probability of C? So Point one. All right, let any questions here? I just took uh, 100 and, and the 300 gallon up. Look at that eight for two. Yeah, it's just showing that the All right, now, while we're here, let's look at the top of page 142. And we are going to assign what's called a complement rule. And what is the complement rule? This is when we're going to say the probability of A occurring is the probability of one minus it occurring. Because remember, the sum of all probabilities have to equal what? One. Okay, so referring to the previous example, the bag of mixed vegetables is underweight. So we said under 0.25. So and the probability of over, that was 0.025 and 0.075. Okay, now use the complement rule to show the probability of a satisfactory bag is 0.9. So how would we know if one minus, so we use one minus 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25. All right, so what's the probability of how are we solving for this? We would add these two probabilities up and subtract it from one. If I do that, what do I get? So adding and subtracting, I guess we could have put this out like this, and subtracting the sum of these two from one. Okay. Let's look at one example of joint probability. Joint probability, a probability that measures the likelihood 
of two or more events will happen concurrently. So I like this big old chart that they, your book shows. First, we're gonna say the probability of Disney. Is equal to 0.6. And the probability of Bush, this is specifically like Bush Gardens, so we have two theme parks, so the probability of Bush is 0.5. Now, what at the top of page 144? How are they describing this area right here? Okay, when we talk about the joint probability, we're saying this is this area right here. So it's Disney and Bush? Disney and Bush. Now we're getting to the and piece. Okay, bottom of page 144. What's the probability that a card chosen at random from a standard deck will either be a king or a heart. Okay, so let's say, we say, what's the probability So we're going to say, what's the probability of a king or a heart? Okay, so what's the probability first? What's the probability of a king equal to? You gamblers, stay with me here. It's, to, it's, it's, it's complement, it's the same, king and heart. No, 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 no. It is not. What's the probability that I draw a king? How many kings are in a standard deck? Four. Four. Out of 52 cards. Oh, okay. Now, what's the probability that I draw a heart? Same probability. It's four students, right? But there's a heart of uh, there's a two thirteen, there's a two, a three, a four, or five. There's only four kings, but there's thirteen hearts in a standard deck. Yeah. Okay, so four divided by fifty-two. What's my probability? What's the probability then of drawing both? It's 96%. Oh, no, no, I'm wrong. Four, sorry, I'm sorry. Four divided into 52. No, what's the probability of drawing a king and a heart? There's only one king of hearts. Okay, so back to this big old example. What was the probability of a king? One over 52. So if we call this A and we call it a king, I'm going to call this B and this is the heart. So my probability of a king was 4 over 52. And the probability of a heart was 13 over 
52. And then what's the probability of A and B? And this was the king and the heart. 52. So what's four divided by 52? Yeah. Well, look, I'm going to keep it in fraction form right now. So 4 over 52. Okay. And then I'm going to add what? Well, now, what do I have to subtract out? 1. I wanted to keep it in fraction terms. That way you could see with a common denominator how I was with everything. And if I solve for this, go back to adding fractions, 13 and four is 17, subtract 16, one, 16. keep my denominator, All right. Well, quickly, we've got about 30 more minutes here. What I want to show you are two more items out of chapter five. And let's get over to Page 146. Okay, rules of multiplication. Now we're going to multiply probabilities. Independence, the is defined by the occurrence of one event has no effect on the probability of the occurrence of another event. And I want you to remember that's an important item to remember. Go back to that coin. Remember, I had an equal chance each time I flipped it of flipping either heads or tails. Nothing was influencing the flip. With the die, we had an equal chance of rolling anywhere from one to six. We didn't have any loaded die. We're not trying to influence the game here. All right, special rules of multiplication. So now, okay, so the probability of A and B occurring is equal to the probability of A. What's that? Plus. Oh, and. Multiplied by the probability of B. Okay, at the top of page 147. A survey by the AAA, American Automobile Association, reveals 60% of its members made airline reservations last year. Two members are selected at random. What is the probability both made an airline reservation last year? Okay, so what are my two outcomes? Wait, 
first, we're going to have to assume that they made a reservation, an airline reservation, and two, that they made it. Uh, first, we're going to have to say they made a reservation, two, that they made an airline reservation. So the probability that the first member made an airline reservation is, and it says here that 60% of its members made airline reservations. So the probability that the first member selected made a reservation, so the first person made a reservation, 100%. Tells us 60%. The probability that the second member selected made a reservation is also 0.6. There's an equal chance that they also made a reservation. To set it up like this. 0.6 multiplied by 0.6 is equal to 0.36. How would you interpret that? That means um, that the percent chance. But remember, if we go all the way back to page 133, you know, the book tells you at point two, there's a chance. Uh, point three, probably slightly better than chance occurrence that this event will occur. Both of these events will occur. You know, we definitely wouldn't say that it is a toss of a coin it's less than 50. So remember, always let this number, you describe it by its strength on where its relationship is between zero and one. Okay, the last item here. So remember, with multiplication, we are one. Want to ensure that we are independent outcomes, each one having an equal chance. And then we're going to multiply the probability of the first outcome by the probability of the second. If we win that solution or in that problem there, had I selected three members, what would have been the probability that the third number, the third member made an airline reservation? Point 0.6. So in that example, we would have had point 0.6 multiplied by point 0.6 multiplied by point 0.6. Okay, conditional probability. Conditional probability. The probability of a particular event occurring given, here's the difference, given that another event has already occurred. So let's look at an example here. A golfer has 12, it sounds like my house, a golfer has 12 shirts in his closet. All right, so I'm going to say that we have, so we have, I'm not going to draw the shirts. So I have 12 shirts in my closet. The probability, let's see here, suppose nine of these shirts are white. And the others are blue. So how many are blue? Three are blue. Now, suppose I get dressed in the dark and I just reach in the closet and grab a shirt. I play golf two days in a row and I do not do laundry. 
What is the likelihood both shirts selected were white? Okay, so the probability of the first shirt being white and the second shirt being white. Okay, so when I just reach in that closet, I pull the shirt out, what's the probability that I pull a white shirt? 175. Let's do this in fractions. Remember, the formula was set up using numerators and denominators. So I have a 9 and 12 probability of selecting a white shirt. Now, on day two, and this is day one. On day two, I go in. Now, how many shirts do I have? How many white shirts yeah. remain in the closet? Eight. Eight. How many total shirts remain in the closet? Eleven. Eleven. Okay, so how many shirts in the closet? Eight, and then where do you get the 11 at? There's 12 shirts total in the closet. Okay. Nine of them were white. Okay. First day I go in and I pull a white shirt out. So what's the probability on day two that I pull a white? Eight. There's only eight white shirts remain, uh -huh. and there's only a total of 11 shirts oh, left okay. in the closet. Okay, gotcha. And if you look right above there, the probability here, we could say the probability of A occurring the probability of B, and this is going to be a straight line given that A has already occurred. So this is your formula in the book. The likelihood here. <coughs> okay. Flip over to page 156. summarize it here. Know that Bayes' theorem, Reverend Thomas Bayes, an English Presbyterian minister, late 18th century. You have a question at one time, whether or not God did exist. So he decided that he was going to try to assign some probability analysis to prove that God did exist. Okay, just know that he started this work. He died before it was completed. One of the people that he was working with came back in Let's see if the book gives you his name. Um, Pierre Simon Laplace came in and found the work one day cleaning out his apartment and picked back up on it and published this thinking of probability that I'm getting ready to show. And to honor Bayes, he gave it his name. At least he was nice and gave it his name. At least he was nice and gave it his name. Okay. Okay, what they say? If you look at page 156, remember this deals with the probability. When we look at the shirt example, we had to apply 
prior pop probabilities. All right, all I want you to do is go back and get familiar. You're not going to be tested on that theorem, but I do want you to go back and at least be able to understand what this says more on a higher level. All right, whether or not he ever proved that God existed. I'll take my chances and say he does. All right, no probability class would be complete if we didn't give an introduction to counting. So if you'll flip over to page 160. Suppose we want to know the number of possible, let's set it up. If the number of possible outcomes in an experiment is small, it's relatively easy to count them. So using that example of rolling a die, we knew we could go anywhere from one through six. However, suppose there's a large number of outcomes. It would be tedious to count all of the probabilities. So we're going to have to and look at counting, and permutations. Okay, let's look at a real life example. An automobile dealer wants to advertise that for $29,999, you can buy a convertible two-door sedan or a four-door model with your choice of either wire wheel covers or solid wheel covers. Based on the number of models and wheel covers, how many different vehicles can the dealer offer? The top of 161, in that example, we could offer a convertible with wire wheel covers, convertible with solid wheel covers, two-door with wire wheels, two-door with solid wheels, four-door with wire wheels, four-door with solid wheel covers. So look at the total possible arrangements. And how many total possible arrangements do I have? Six. Six. So right now, total number of arrangements. The book's going to give you this. If you had a third, and you would just put it so on and so on. Now permutation. You draw over that top and mount zero, and it's like oh, so zero now. A permutation, any arrangement of R objects selected from a single group of possible objects. All right, so for a permutation, we see that the permutation, and you're going to see it set up like this. What's the end? the total number of objects. And what's that exclamation point mean? Um, this is a factorial. Okay, so <laughs> N is gonna denote the total number of objects. R number of objects selected. And when I use this factorial, remember that if I write five here, how would that translate? Five times four times three times two times one. Shorthand so that I don't have to write all that out. 
Okay, so in this example, let's look at referring to the group of electronic parts that are to be assembled in any order. How many different ways could they have been assembled? So remember in the prior example, We had a total number of three car types, a convertible, a two-door, or a four-door, and each of those could have either had wire wheel covers or solid wheel covers. So what were the total number of objects? Total number of objects I had, a convertible, a four-door, a two-door. So you could have marked it like this. What was the question again? The bottom of page 162. How many different ways can these be assembled? Oh, okay. okay I got you. Now, if I would have come in and selected What's the R in this formula? Seven. What's the R in this formula? Wisconsin, you're being awful quiet. We just got a little bit longer. That would have been the cars. Based on this alone, you would have known that if I took three, what's this equal Six. to? Okay, remember, combinations, they are occurring. Permutations, we're putting them in order. That's how I always remember them, being able to separate. You said a lot about Yeah, permutate, we're putting them in order. All right, so let's look. Permutation, an arrangement of our objects. So an arrangement. And if we look at combination, remember a combination is what were the event that two were occurring. Combined. Correct. Two occurring combined. Permutation, think about it of being arranged in order. You're talking about in order, for example, three, two, one. That's what you're talking about in order being in some type of arrangement. You're using a more specific example, yes. All right, let's do one more example here. Look at page 163. Machine shop has eight screw machines, but only three spaces available. And how many different ways can the eight machines be arranged in the three spaces that are available? OK, 
okay, eight screw machines, but only three spaces available. And how many different ways can the eight machines be arranged in the three spaces that are available? So look, eight possibilities for the first arrangement. Seven for the second, and six for the third. So I have eight machines with three spaces available. So I could have, now I've already used one of these. Two. So we get now interpret that outcome. Well, 336, so this tells me that there's a total of 336 different possible arrangements. We can also find this by applying this formula. And the book tells you right here to apply this formula. Looking right under this, we would have said And then you can solve this out. Simplify it. And remember, this is the same as 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 divided 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 2. This half of calculator um, can do that, right? And that's what I was just going to end with this. Make sure you do go back and look. I mean, your calculator might probably does if you're running a scientific calculator. I see some of them. Financial calculators might even pick it up to uh, permutations. Because that will become very tedious. Keep writing that out. That's still my head.